and we are here. So you were just talking about the first loft that you guys got in Los Angeles. Yeah, and it wasn't even a loft. It was it was the warehouse. We had a loft. When I moved out uh, to L.A. in 2003, my brothers had already been here for a few years. And, you know, they were living in houses and, and wherever, scattered around. And they got the bug to, you know, they're artists. They just got the bug, like, I want to live in a loft. So they found this really cool loft space downtown, right under the 10 freeway, uh, just south of the Arts District. And, you know, back then the Arts District was pretty raw. Now, if you go down there, it's, it's you know, you have your blue bottle coffee. Um, so they moved into this loft, and it was kind of a leap of faith. And then when I moved out, uh, there were kind of two bedrooms in it. They were, they were open. It was big open space. But we built this really rickety kind of loft within the loft that was just my bedroom platform, you know, and I had to climb a ladder on top of the bathroom and crawled out over the entire, like, two-story loft space. So it was, you know, it was fun. And while we were there, we were kind of starting um, what is now the Lab, and the space I was telling you about was, uh, you know, a big warehouse. That that was a big leap of faith. We um, we rented that for five years and, and just kind of went all in on it. And you mentioned um, kind of strategy. There was no strategy, and there was no business plan, and there still isn't. You know, because this didn't start as a business. It didn't start like, oh, you know, any typical business would. This was an art project that eventually evolved into a business. Right. Yeah. You built a culture yeah. and then found a way to monetize that. Yeah. And it wasn't, you know, it was part like, hey, let's monetize this and make a living off of it. But not in a, you know, let's make a bunch of money. It was to sustain the art and the culture. And now as we've grown, it's like, yeah, we make a living doing what we love. But in the beginning, it was just to keep financing the art, financing the culture. Right. And you said that early on, uh, you were living with Lucid Dossier. Um, and who who is that for people who don't know? Yeah, when we when we first started the Do Lab, Dream Rockwell was uh, a part of that, and um, a part of the Do Lab in the early days, in the beginning, uh, we were throwing events, we were throwing parties, and we wanted to have that interactive element as a part of all of our parties and events. Uh, and, and Lucent Dossier formed as part of the Do Lab in the early days. And Dream spearheaded that. And, um, you know, that our warehouse where they were, you know, just starting uh, and we were living and building the Do Lab and building Lucent Dossier uh, was just an open door for people. Were you guys physically building structures in that warehouse? Oh, yeah. Tell yeah. me about that. Uh, you know, and if you've seen our structures, a lot of them are. Uh, larger than life so um, we would build what we could in the warehouse but we also took a took over the front of the warehouse which was interesting um, we'd be out there you know and our neighbors there was like an uh, LA bus you know city bus was one of our neighbors uh, you know some import exporters uh, you know just the random stuff you'd find downtown were all of our neighbors and they would be there from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day. Uh, when they would leave and all the parking spaces would open up, we'd go outside and work late into the night and just start building our large sculptures and towers. And, uh, you know, the fire department fire department showed up one night, like, what the hell are you guys <laughs> doing? Because we have these 40, 50-foot, you know, sculptures and towers rigged to the side of our warehouse that are, you know, a foot away from the power lines. And the fire department's like, you guys can't do this. Like, this is insane. Uh, so we pushed the envelope. We would build things on top of our warehouse. Anywhere where we could find space, we'd build and create. Um, uh, that's, it's like in that scene, Clerks. You ever see Clerks? Yeah. Where they have the hockey game on top of the roof? Yeah, that was us. I mean, we used to love watching Clerks, too. Uh, but, yeah, if give us an inch. You know, and we're going to take a mile. And that's that's how we were able to build what we built and create what we created. It was just like just thinking outside the box. And yeah. 
And that's you and uh, your two younger twin brothers? Older twin Older twin brothers. Yeah. My, my two brothers are twins, um, Jesse and Josh, and, and we've been partners at this forever. Um, you know, we've always been kind of doing things, creating things our whole lives. Our parents were... Um, our parents loved to entertain. You know, they were old hippies back in the day. We always grew up around a, a close-knit group of family and friends, so we were always entertaining, and, and that energy just kind of stayed with us. So, uh, yeah, we're still partners today and doing our thing. Um, I have a, a little anecdote that I thought you'd appreciate, um, which is that so there was a study done in Wales where they re-landscaped a prison to have more green space and give the prisoners access to view trees from their cell. And violent instances within the prison dropped dramatically. And I think it's really interesting how spaces create and largely shape human behavior. And I see that on a macro scale, when you guys are building these kinds of structures, you're inducing a feeling into people and it will shape the way that they interact with not only the structure, but also each other at the festivals. And I wanted to ask if you guys actually have those kinds of conversations when you are building those structures. Like you guys have everything from you know the the tree peas to the squids to scrambled eggs, uh, pagoda star pods. Like you, these are crazy names of structures that you guys yeah. build. When you guys are building them, are you thinking like we want people to feel really relaxed when we go here and induce this kind of like psycho spiritual renaissance for participants when they see these structures? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit, uh, but I don't want to, um, jump into my brother's brain too much, but Josh is the one that designs everything that, that we build and create. And, you know, Jesse and I get to be a part of that process in the sense that Josh would always be kind of head down in his notebook sketching and he'd always show us. And, um, I could see where... You know, and what you just mentioned with the prison and the trees. When we were living downtown, our existence was downtown. We didn't get out. You know, we lived in a warehouse. We worked 12, 15 hours a day. We were surrounded by dirt and grime, and it was rugged. And you could see that a bit in Josh's early work. And um, his influences were, you know, very industrial. Now, everything, not everything, but a lot of what we do is very whimsical. So he, he kind of, he looks to nature a lot. Um, and I did notice that eventually when we, we kept our warehouse, but we decided not to live there anymore, we moved to Venice. And that just changed our lives a lot because we got to ride bikes again. We got to go to the beach again. We got to live outside of a warehouse space. And that was you know, us looking at the trees outside of the prison walls. Um, and you could see how that changed uh, some of the designs and some of the structures in that era around like 2008, 2009. Um, but yeah, Josh and, you know, Jesse, although Josh designs it, you know, he's always bouncing things off of his twin. You know, they they think alike, they... They're twins. I mean, I could go on for days about uh, what that dynamic is like, but those two feed off of each other, and they're always hyper aware of environments that we're in. We all are, but the experience that they're creating is is always at the forefront. So it's not just I want to build something cool that looks cool. It's it is how are people going to receive it? How are they going to get to experience this. Um, and there's a lot of thought that goes into the designs with how it's going to be received by people. That's interesting for me because my brain doesn't quite work the same way. So it takes me, I, I don't want to say I'm skeptical. My brain works in a way that is like, well, how are we going to do that? Is that possible? Um, 
I used to, you know, brainstorm with them and I noticed it would stress me out because (laughs) they would go into a brainstorm with zero rules. You know, if you want a telephone pole to float 40 feet in the air, cool. That's going to be part of the brainstorm. And I'd be like, well, that, how's that possible? And then my brain starts spinning. So I stopped getting into some of those brainstorms because I didn't want to bring them down and I didn't want to stress myself out. But every time we would get to the event, whether it's LIB, whether it's Coachella or any of the other projects that we've created for, and I would stand in these structures and I would just be like, oh shit, that's what he was thinking. That's what they were thinking. Now it all makes sense because it's so thoughtful from the very beginning and it really translates when you're standing in what we create. So have it, along the lines of having the art shift with you guys moving to Venice into a place that has more green space, have you seen the art shift? I mean, you guys have been doing it for, for 20 years. Like, have you guys seen it? Have you seen imprints of the art shifting, um, as your brothers have gone through different experiences in their lives. Totally. Right? Like artists will always say, you know, that the, it's a representation of them yeah. at that time. Oh, for sure. Um, you know, just watching Josh's process, looking at his the models that he creates, whether on the computer or whether with cardboard and toothpicks, um, you, you definitely get a sense of that. And... Uh, We always joke because if he designs something too early, like if he gets a head start on the Coachella structure and, you know, starts designing it a year out, it's, you know, we know it's never going to come to life because he's going to get bored with it. And he sits with it too long and he, um, I don't know the process, he psychs himself out or he just gets bored with it and doesn't want to do that anymore. Like he wants everything to be fresh and new. So he needs a little shorter of a window to create so that it stays exciting and and, uh, relevant. But yeah, I definitely see um, influences in his life and and how that translates to the the stuff we create. Uh, You know the writer Sebastian Younger? Mm -hmm. He he was once asked, how do you write best? And he said, I write best when I'm coming up on deadline. Uh, Same. Uh, I can't do... I couldn't do school papers a week ahead of time. I had to do them the night before. It's just how I operated. Yeah, I think there's something about like inducing the feeling of sprinting that can get you over a lot of self doubt because there's just not time for it. Yeah, and I for me it's it's adrenaline, um, and I need that adrenaline of a deadline of are we going to make it? Is this going to get done? Uh, to really push me into that next level that where I'm going to do my best work. Um, if, if I have a week to do something, I'm just like, I don't want to do it. You <laughs> yeah. know, I need, I need to be up against it. Yeah. Do you think that you and your brothers, uh, are adrenaline junkies? I'd say so. Yeah. Um, I for sure am. Um, I do a little more of the, you know, physical, um, uh, adrenaline stuff, you know, whether it's surfing or, uh, you know, I'm the one that would be the first one to jump out of a plane and go skydiving. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Uh, they're adrenaline junkies in, in the other way where, you know, these events, the, the adrenaline we get from the crowds, from the people we bring together. And I get that too, but yeah, so we're, we're definitely all adrenaline junkies. How do you, uh, how do you manage that? Like, yeah, I mean, I've just for most people, just going to Burning Man and setting up their own camp is an adrenaline rush because there's just so much to think about and handle and condense it into in a short period of time. It's like times that by one thousand. Yeah. Right? Is there anything that you'll you'll do because it's just constant problems? I would imagine leading up to it. Is there anything that you have like as calming practices before you? are leading up to a huge event? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny you ask that, like I'm in it right now. Um, I leave for LIB in a week and just got back from Coachella and I'm stressed. You know, we all are like, we have so much to do and there's so much riding on 
pulling this many people together uh, and creating the city that we create. For me, um, I like the simple things. You know, I rode my bike here to meet you today. That is grounding for me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the beach person, so I'll try and go out and surf, which is my meditation and where I go to escape everything and just kind of look at the city behind me while I'm floating on the edge of the country. It's like, it's, it's peaceful for me to, you know, be in nature. I, I do like to go off on my own and be solo a lot. Um, when I'm exposed to big crowds all the time and the energy of everyone that, that we work with and uh, just spending almost a month at Coachella, like, it's amazing. That process is so rewarding and so awesome. But there's so much energy exchange uh, with with our team while we're building this thing, then with everyone that's you know at the festival and and in our backstage, and there's so much energy exchange there that I need to escape and be by myself. And um, sometimes it's just driving. Sometimes it's driving and sitting at Topanga and watching the ocean and just sitting in my car and. Um, having that alone time uh, also be the random guy that's you know sitting at the bar by himself just having a having a burger and a beer and and just being alone yeah man i can i can absolutely relate to that um <laughs> there's this great louis ck joke where he's like you know when you when you have kids you look for these little mini vacations like you put the kid in the car and then you run around to the other side of the car and you're like oh thank god <laughs> and that's your vacation yeah but I think that that's, there's wisdom in that, man, because life never stops coming at you. And if you can find those little chunks of time where you can exhale fully and just not get addicted to that kind of distraction, I think you can maintain a lot of energy. Totally. And, you know, I actually, this past year during the pandemic, started doing some breath work and... um you know, I just started doing some Wim Hof YouTubes. Uh, I, I don't remember how, you know what it was? I was in Ecuador for New Year's a few years back. And uh, I wish I remembered his name, but he's a doctor. He's, he's um, kind of, I don't know if he left Western medicine, but he was focusing on gut health and, um, you know, he created something to, for that but he invited us to this yoga deck and to do a breath workshop and it was new to me you know we have that at lib we have it everywhere i just never really did it and it's he, funny how many how much you like you can preach and then still just not do the practices like we have that at Mudwater so often where it's like why do i feel shitty I'm like, oh, i haven't been sleeping well like this is what we write ads about all the time <laughs> yeah right who knew yeah. um yeah, we don't. I don't have time at LIB to go take the yoga classes and the workshops. Like I do that stuff, you know, privately when I'm home. But I never get into the breath work. And when I did this uh, exercise with him, he explained what was going to happen, what we were going to feel, sensations we were going to have, things we might see, colors we might see. And I was just like, whatever. Like, uh, okay, let's do it. And it was it was unreal. There were maybe 15 of us, and I just went so deep. And when I finally came to, after doing this guided breath work, uh, I looked around and everyone was gone. It was just him sitting behind me and me laying there in, in whatever world I was in. And I was tingly and I was high and, I, it, you know, I was high. It was just as simple as that. And I was like, I didn't take anything, but I was high. And... I sat with that all day because I felt like I was coming down from a high for a better part of that day. And it was just kind of eye opening for me. Um, and I didn't do it again for a little bit. I don't know why, just life busy. Um, but then I started doing some of the Wim Hof stuff and I've gotten back to that place and just doing breath holds and it really settles me down and relaxes me. And, uh, so that's that's a big one for me now. Just doing that when I can. Yeah, you can even do that when you're out surfing. A good uh, a good way to train for surfing bigger waves is you you duck dive a wave, hold your breath, and try and hold your breath until you duck dive the next wave. And it's pretty insane how quickly your mind will start to panic 
But if you can do it in a safe environment before you're actually in big waves, you get to work with that feeling of discomfort within a context that's not, it's similar to when you're surfing bigger waves, but it's still a safe environment. And I find that that's a really good way to, to train yourself to get comfortable in bigger waves. Yeah. I need to do that and keep practicing this in different environments. You know, I do it on my deck, on my yoga mat and it's very safe and it's very peaceful and I can hold my breath for a really long time. And, um, it's just very calming. I have, I know it's not recommended, but I've definitely been doing it in a swimming pool a little bit where I'm actually going on underwater and, and doing breath holds. Um, but yeah, I, I should try it in more challenging spaces because that's, that's where it's needed the most. That's where the calm is needed the most. And, you know, I'm about to go to LIB and I don't think I've been doing any breath works since before the pandemic. So it is a good opportunity for me to practice this while I'm on site, while I'm dealing with the stress and the chaos. So, yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you just a bit more about those behind the scenes practices that, that help you maintain your energy levels and things that you'll, that you'll not do because you'll, you know, if you try and partake in, in all the fun, you'll, spiral into a dark pit sure. about 48 hours, I would imagine. Yeah. So what are, so, um, what are some of those other things that you, you do like rules or guidelines for yourself to be able to maintain energy? Yeah. For me personally, um, I try and get sleep. Yeah. It's, it's hard. You know, we, we work some late nights. Um, <clears throat> and this time of year is challenging. I know for my brothers and myself, um, we're just the, the personalities where we have so much going on that once our brains turn on, that's it. So usually at night, we, we have a lot of restless nights this time of year. Our diets get a little shifty. Uh, our sleep gets a little shifty, and it's hard. So I try and get the sleep where I can. Um, you know, with, with the anxiety that comes with some of the stuff that we do, uh, it's hard to eat the way that you would normally eat. So I try and, you know, get the smoothies in where I can and, uh, get that nutrition as, as best I can. Um, cause you don't want to eat a meal, but you know, you have to. So stuff like that. Uh, last time at LIB, because we're on a lake now, uh, it was cool. Every, every night around sunset, I would take maybe half hour and I would swim in the lake and I would, park my quad on one side and then I'd, uh, I'd swim back and forth, um, and, and just get that exercise in. And I didn't get to do it every day, but, uh, I did it most days. And one of my buddies on site who comes out and builds with us, uh, if he'd see me like hyper stressed, which happens out there, uh, he, he just grabbed me a couple times and he was like, go swim. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I don't have time. He was like, go swim. And I was like, okay. And I would do it and, and, you know, I finish and I just, I feel alive. I feel fresh. I feel energized. And while I'm doing that and while I'm in that swimming mode, um, it's, it's a chance for me. I don't clear my mind, but I redirect my mind and I start thinking about more positive things and I just need to get the, the stress and the negative things out. And so then I need to find those environments like swimming, um, like surfing, uh, where I can just go free my, my mind from the, the noise. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a big one on site. I'm going to try and do that again this year. Uh, I think I might take my bike and, and just do some morning bike rides or something. Uh, cause you know, we're getting older too. <laughs> it's not, we're not young kids Shh. anymore. Don't tell anybody. Yeah. Uh, you can't tell your body it's getting older. You yeah. can't let it know. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to, to you know, creating culture. Um, I've experienced you know, working at, at Mud, which is a pretty fast-growing company. That what what happens, and I think that there might be a parallel here to a lot of organizations, is uh, you have an idea that's very different. There's a huge amount of differentiation in that thought, and there's also relevance to the culture. Um, so the two two words are differentiation and relevance. And when you can get those two things in whether it's a product or a festival um, or a, a song, 
it, it can explode into culture in a massive way. And then through that growth process, what ends up happening is you you bring more people onto the team and inherently humans are, we're such social creatures that we look around us for things that other people are doing and we say, oh, well, they're doing it that way, so we should too. And all of a sudden, your differentiation starts to bleed into being the same as everyone else. And there needs to be this, it's like, actively fighting for your differentiation as you can as you scale Mm -hmm. um and that's a lot of the conversations that we have at mud it's like well if they're doing it this way we should probably zag in the other direction as a rule yeah and i just i want to leave that question kind of open-ended because i would imagine that that's just a massive amount of what takes up your brothers and your mental landscape as you've been developing this thing. Totally. Uh, it's funny you mentioned that because we, we always have a lot of people working with us and, um, you know, when we first met the, uh, the venue owner, when we moved LIB in 2010 to, uh, Lake Irvine, uh, we went down there and met this guy, Gary James. And, it's funny, he came out to visit us at Coachella. We've remained friends over the years. Uh, he said, oh, yeah, so there's been some events here before. And, okay, so this is this is where they put the main stage. So you should put the main stage over there. And this is where we, you know, do this. And we're like, okay, tell me more. Tell me exactly what we're not going to do. We're not going to do anything that's been done before. Uh, anytime someone would say, well, this is how it's done, or this is how we should do it, or this is how, you know, other people do it. Like, great, you know, not even going to entertain that. We're going to do the complete opposite. Um, Just because we do want it to be different. We want it to be our own. We don't want it to be anyone else's. And we also don't believe in the rules that dictate why it should have been done that way or why someone did it that way we want to just kind of rewrite the rule book and that was a big part of it it's not just like we want to be dicks and be like well we're going to do it our own way like screw you it was more just conventional wisdom may say do it one way and we want to prove that it can be done the other way as effective or better Um, and and that i think has been very much a part of uh who we are from day one um you know and then it's also a challenge when someone says you can't do it that way it doesn't work be like well we're gonna prove you wrong um you know there's some ego in there but uh it was part of the challenge Mm -hmm. and we always wanted to challenge ourselves and prove people we could do it differently and do it better um so yeah go for it well and then the first part that you mentioned bringing a lot of people together and then you start to have different opinions different viewpoints um we because we were just an art project and an experiment you know i think we're still an experiment um and unlike mud we're not you know we're not trying to prove anything scientifically we're not trying to um stimulate a physical response or anything we're, we're purely emotional. So we have less rules uh, that we need to follow. And when we would have people come in to our project, uh, they would have their own set of skills or their own passions or their own you know things that they wanted to contribute. And we were always of the mindset of like, hey, what do you want to contribute? What do you want to do? How do you want to be presented at LIB? How do you want to contribute to this project? Because we may not have that already. And, and spearhead it. Go ahead. Lead it. And um, not everyone wanted to bring something to the table um, as an offering, maybe. But they wanted to contribute. They wanted to work with us and be a part of it. And maybe that wasn't the right fit that year. But we're like, okay, uh, that wasn't for you. But tell me what you want to do next year. Like what burns your fire? Uh, so for those early years, it was cool. Cause it was just like everyone, it was a puzzle being put together differently every year. 
and we really got to see um, where people shined. And a lot of those people are still with us today doing what they brought in 10, 15 years ago. Um, so it, it was neat to see and um, neat to feed off of. Yeah, well, if you, I think it's smart that you frame up some of those conversations with artists like, what do you want to do? Sky's the limit because it gives them permission to bring out their best art. Yeah. And that contributes to the authenticity of the whole experience, which is what ma- uh, magnetizes a lot of people to it, right? Like no one wants a plastified weird festival where they feel like they have to be um, hyper self-conscious and you know, we see those festivals, we see those events where everyone just feels stiff yeah. because the environment is stiff because the people creating it were stiff when they made it. But if you can embed that code early on in that ethos, I think that it just permeates out when you throw the festival and the participants feel it. A- absolutely. Um, that's, that's a huge part because we would always say, we're not just throwing this festival for you, we're throwing it for us. And not in a selfish way, but we're throwing the event that we want to be at and that we want to participate in. So, you know, we would throw LIB or Coachella. You know, let's use Coachella for an example. We, in the early days, um, if you wanted to play music on our stage and DJ, you had to come out and build with us. And you had to be a part of the process. And uh, your reward for being a part of the build team and the build process was that you got to DJ and, and do your thing. Uh, it's, it's not that way now, but it used to be when we started. And the energy that we would bring to the event and to our stage was all the people that created it with us, not just builders. You know, We had friends that were good at sewing, so we'd get them involved. Here, we're going to find something to sew. We had, uh, you know, our friend Nikki, who was our caterer for years because she's an amazing cook. And that was her contribution. Like, all right, well, let's have you come and feed us in camp. Everyone had something they could contribute. And it didn't mean that they had to be a skilled builder to build, like, cool big art. Uh, So then once the event actually started, all of those people that contributed are now the ones on stage dancing and shooting people with water guns and and bringing that energy level to the event, and that translates directly to the audience. And they feel included now. And there's this um, energy exchange where it's not just audience staring at stage, you know, maybe dancing, maybe not. You know, we're not, it's not a spectator sport when you come to anything do lab. It's a participat- participatory um, adventure. So the, the energy that, everyone involved in creating it brings to the festival, to the show, whatever it is, uh, translate directly to the audience. Um, so yes, when you have, uh, our early sustainability team, you know, really pushing all of these initiatives for greening LIB, uh, it translates directly from us, the creators of it and the ones working it and building it to the people that are enjoying it. Um, we see it, you know, it's just proven. It's, it's right there in front of us every year. Yeah. Yeah. How how do you, I would imagine that you've gained a lot of good conversational skills in how to disagree with people while still keeping them on your team. Yeah. Because I mean, I think that one, you know, I'm asking purely selfishly here because I'm a writer and when people try and say like, oh no, don't put that in, don't put this in, like I have a a primal and violent response first inside me yeah. <laughs> and there's a, there's a period of time where I just need to go like do whatever I need to do to work through that yeah. because the the long tail of cleaning up the wreckage from having an explosion is just way too high of a price tag to do it. And I would imagine that for you, like keeping that authenticity and constantly having those conversations um, has been a journey. And I wonder if you have like, what have been the skills that have helped you most 
work through those difficulties. Yeah, for sure. Um, my advice would be to uh, have three of you <laughs> because um, I'm, I'm probably the one that has more of those conversations. Uh, my brothers are more the artists, not they are the artists. I, I don't look at myself as an, a traditional artist, but you know, the way that I can kind of pull things together and, and problem solve and, and, you know, use different skill sets is, is a bit of an art form that I've developed over the years. But my brothers will be the ones that will be more reactionary to things and maybe blow things up, um, and create that wreckage. Uh, and then I will be there to smooth it over, clean it up, you know, talk it through, <laughs> uh, you know, and we joke about it, but it is the dynamic. Um, we're all sensitive, but they're, they're super sensitive. And that sensitivity is someone telling them they can't do something or, you know, and that happens a lot. Like I deal with the government side of things. I deal with the agencies, the bureaucracy of it all with people that tell you what you can and can't do and they mean it, you know, and, and you can't necessarily convince them or, or, um, get them to change their stance. So then I have to take that energy, which is gnarly and go to my brothers and find a way to delicately be like, we can't do that. Fuck you. Why? You know, who said, um, and I'll be like, look, it's, it's a law <laughs> or it's a regulation or it's a fire code or it's whatever it is. And they're pissed, you know, and cause they don't want that restriction in the creative process. And I understand that. And I've, I've learned how to really walk that line. Um, and I know how to approach them with stuff like that. I know when to bring it up, when not to bring it up. Timing is always important. Um, bringing that kind of stuff up in a brainstorming process, never good. You know, it's like let the brainstorm happen and then introduce that element later. Um, and then teaching other people on our team, like, hey, this is when and when not to approach the guys or me or someone with this type of news um, or this type of energy. Because there has to be a place for all of it. It's, it's, it may be unwanted energy, but it's necessary. So then you have to finesse when and how and why and who and all of those things. Um, yeah, so I've, I've become more of the conversationalist. I, uh, we have a huge team and everyone does have different thoughts and opinions and wants and desires and, and all of that is heightened when we're living together for a month on site, when we're all trying to do our best work, when there's conflict that's introduced into the middle of that, there has to be some sort of creative conflict resolution. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I say to people is take a breath and take a step back and look at the big picture or just put it into perspective. Don't react so quickly. It's easy to react so quickly. And then you just set people off, you set yourself off, and then damage control and cleanup after that is so much harder and, and stressful than stepping back, processing for a second before you react, before you dive in. Um, it's hard to do. But that's what I encourage people to do. And, um, you know, you, you do see it take place and, and you see more positive results from it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think gaining that, it's like, you know, young kids drive fast because they think that's what cool people do. Yeah. But if you can convince them that slow driving is just smooth driving, you reframe that. And I think that similarly, we're, we're kind of taught that the, the macho, bombastic, reactionary alpha is what you do. But so much more often, I think real 
people who can achieve success and in, in longevity are the coolest cucumbers in the room. And yeah. then their superpower is to be able to maintain calm when everyone else is freaking out. Totally. Um, <clears throat> and I have my freak outs. And, uh, <laughs> Appreciate know, that. <laughs> I'm not like this zen whatever. Like people, people joke, they can see it on my face. You know, I, I wear it on my face. Um, if I'm not happy, someone near me knows. And, uh, you know, I do, I, I've learned that I have more of a responsibility being a leader, that I need to keep that in check more. And I can't be so reactionary. I can't roll up to something that I don't like and just be super reactionary and angry. And it, it does damage. Um, you know, people want to feel honored for what they're doing and what they contribute. They want to feel recognized. They want to be seen. Um, and, you know, I look at the side of it with, with my brothers and I, and we want, we have a vision for what we want to create. And the pieces of the puzzle that we put together, we want to see it a certain way. So sometimes we lose sight of that first part, acknowledging people, recognizing them, because that's how we want to be. You know, when we're building a Coachella for someone else's festival, it means the world to us when, you know, the guys that put that festival on come up and acknowledge us and, and honor us for what we've created. It means a lot to us. It touches us and it inspires us to keep moving forward. And what we need to keep reminding ourselves, and my brothers and I try and do this, is we need to treat everyone else that's working with us and for us the exact same way because we know what that means. Um, so when you come in hot, when you come in reactionary, it takes a toll on people. It's damaging. And, and then you got to go into that, that damage control and that, you know, um, it's, it's all a practice, man. It's like, we're all learning out there and we all have to, I, I think the brother element, I know the brother element is, is why we're able to do what we do and why we've been successful is because the three of us keep each other in check. It's as simple as that. There's no, um, we always joke and we always talk about the story of the brothers, whatever. Like we could fight like crazy, you know, physical fights sometimes, not so much anymore, but we used to. And at the end of the day, it's like, we're just going to go get a beer and be like, cool, all good. No big deal. You can't do that with other relationships, whether it's friends, even relatives, whatever, uh, because we're brothers and we're so close and we've been through it all together. We can treat each other that way and shake it off at the end of the day. And we need to keep reminding each other that our actions and reactions uh, can be detrimental and hurtful and harmful. And we try and keep reminding ourselves of that. Yeah, that's smart, man. And yeah, I, I think too, so often the, the reaction and the anger is just behind it is a fear that you're losing control. Totally. Totally. It's like that. And, and that's why you're like, what the fuck are we doing? I feel like I don't have it all under control right now. Uh, and I'll tell you what, most of the time we feel like we're losing control. Like we're building a city for LIB. We're building a huge city and there's so much in that. And there's a million pieces to that. And there's so many people doing it. But at the end of the day, it's our responsibility. And taking all that in is just so much pressure and so much like it's hard um so yeah we <laughs> there is a constant feeling of losing control do you have any uh any mentors or people who you respect who have been able to do great things and not become you know narcissistic and spiral out of control and you know just explode as so many people so many people do you know when you get when you become successful you just end up with a new set of problems and i would be i feel like you've become pretty you just seem aware of that and you seem aware of the pitfalls um and it's really cool and i was wondering if you've had any people who have really impacted your life um or who you can use as models yeah for sure um <clears throat> you know the, the second part of that it's like 
you know, and I think I can speak for my brothers here as well. Like we don't feel like we are super successful. You know, we don't look at it that way. Um, I see people that uh, quote unquote successful, whatever, you know, they've achieved something or they're in the spotlight. We don't like to be in the spotlight. We're not seeking the spotlight. So if that's a, a measure of success for someone, an influencer or whatever, like they just crave the spotlight and that's success to them. And they, you know, that gives them the right to act douchey or whatever. <laughs> that That's not us. Like that's not what we're in it for. We're in it to create cool stuff. So th- we measure the success based on the reactions we get from people and um, that, that fuels us. So in that regard, I'd say that we're all pretty humble. Like we've always been pretty humble. Our parents keep us humble, you know, our friends keep us humble. Um, and we keep each other humble. It's like, yeah, I, you know, we watch people that, you know, are not, and it's just pretty unattractive. It's just like, I don't want to be that way. Um, so there's that. And, you know, looking at mentors, like you had mentioned, I definitely have my mentors, you know, a few of the people that, that run Coachella, like that, that's a, a huge influence on, on the three of us. We started out doing our installation at Coachella, I think around 2004. <clears throat> that's right at the same time that we threw LIB as a 24 hour party. And as we've grown LIB, We've been growing uh, our installation now stage at Coachella. It's all parallel. And um, we watch Coachella and we've always looked to them as they always had it figured out. They always nailed it. They were always perfect. And uh, that was just the way that we perceived it. That wasn't reality. The reality was Coachella is like every other festival is screwing it up everywhere they turn every decision they make it's just like oh bad decision next year we got to change that uh that didn't work out the way we thought it was going to and they're continually learning and growing and they had their um documentary come out um two years ago that was their 20 year anniversary and watching that was just like holy shit it, it's it, that's our journey we're screwing up every step of the way. We're making dumb decisions that we have to correct and change the next year. Like we're always trying to innovate, but we're always making decisions that either prove to work or not work. So it's always a work in progress. Uh, so for me, watching those guys that put that show on and being able to call them and bounce things off of them and talk about challenges that we're having, that's always been really helpful and grounding for me. And you know, if I have some disastrous news Sometimes with LIB, you know, my first phone call will be to, you know, Bill Fold, who's, um, he was the director of Coachella and now he's, um, you know, just higher up doing something, uh, over there. But I've always looked to him, you know, for guidance, for mentorship and, and for perspective. And, uh, you know, it, it's helped me along the way, but I have, I have a whole group of what I call mentors and advisors for all different things in all different areas. And I encourage anyone doing anything in life to have your group of advisors around you, whether it's friend for personal stuff, whether it's, you know, that one guy that, you know, happens to be really good at accounting, you know, something trivial and boring that I don't have an interest in, but, uh, you know, professionally and personally, like having advisors you can go to, to just be a sounding board, just to hear you, just to get some advice. Like it's crucial. Yeah. And I think it goes both ways because they feel valued when you're calling them up. Absolutely. And I, I play that role for people. You know, I have people that look at me as a mentor and as an advisor. And I, I absolutely love that. You know, I love sharing what I know. I love, um, you know, brainstorming with other people and, because we're, we're all going to benefit from that relationship. It's not one-sided by any means. So I, I really enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to, uh, you know, so Shane, who, who started Mudwater, talks about um, going to Lightning in a Bottle pretty early on and having a really formative art experience where he, 
he went to LIB and he saw some live artists there. It was really the first time he had seen a festival that was um, encouraging live art in that way um, as part of the whole deal. And he went back the next year and was like, it w- he said it was like him breaking out of his shell and like actually presenting that um, living piece, you know, and, and not just do it working on it all back there, but working on it out in the open was a, a super formative experience. Um, and I just wanted you to touch on the, the aspect of live art at Lightning in a Bottle, because it doesn't happen at every festival. No, it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> no, it doesn't. Uh, and it's something that, you know, again, we're participatory and we're always trying to create an experience, not just something to look at, but something to be a part of. And the act of watching art happen in front of you is, uh, it's a powerful thing. You know, I remember as a kid going to, um, you know, a few festivals and, and just your local county fair type stuff. And I remember just standing there watching the guy doing like spinning pottery. You know, that to me was just mind blowing. I'm like, mesmerizing. It's super mesmerizing. One, it's just going in circles and you're just like, <laughs> you know, in a bit of a trance, but you're watching something come to life right before your eyes. Yeah. And I think that does a few things, right? It, it just inspires you, um, to that, that stuff can happen. Like, okay, I saw a a salad ball on the shelf at, at Ross, where the hell's that come from? But when you see a guy spinning pottery and making a salad bowl, you're just like, Oh wow. It just like, it, it invokes so many different you know, possibilities in your mind. Seeing live art is, um, you know, and it also tells you that you can do that too. And that's the big one. It, it says like, get off your ass, get off the couch, you know, stop doing whatever you're doing and go create something. It might not be a painting. It might not be pottery, whatever, but there's something in you that is untapped. And I think hearing stories over the years from LIB, people get that inspiration and they realize that there was some untapped resource inside of them that they were so inspired they were just triggered to go home and figure out what that was. And it changes the direction of people's lives. Like we see it, but we, more importantly, we hear it and we get those stories all the time. And Shane's one of them, you know, uh, people just get that, that just huge burst of inspiration and uh, that for us is just so rewarding. Yeah, man, showing the behind the scenes aspect of art um, reduces the distance between novice and expert because the novice gets this, to see that it was just a process. And I think that that's such an important point that you, when you can witness that imperfection in the early iterations of it, it gives you permission to try it yourself. Absolutely. It is recognizing that things aren't perfect, that, um, I like to cook and I was always intimidated to cook because there were rules surrounding it. There were, there were recipes, right? It was all based on recipes, the recipe card, everything to the ounce, to the gram, to the degree, whatever. And it's just like, oh, that's so hard. And so I never cooked. And then somewhere along the way, I was, I was just like, oh, you don't have to cook it that long or you don't have to use that tablespoon of whatever. You could be creative with it and you could, you could explore. And for me, it was like cooking showed me that shit does not have to be based on a recipe. It could be based on whim. It could be based on whatever. That's what art is. It's like, and that's how Bourdain saw it. Exactly. Right? Um, I think that's what he showed a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so that, that was really eye opening. So when people see artists creating themselves and they get to see the process the artist goes through, they get to, to really learn that it's not about perfection. It's about the process. Do you know that if there was an, uh, like where that idea came from to do live art at your festivals? Yeah. <coughs> you want some water? You good. I'm probably good. Okay. Sorry. Just a couple more minutes. That's the desert lung. Should have um, water. Sorry. It's all good. <laughs> um, what, repeat that question. Um, do you know where the idea of live art came from for you guys' festival? 
Um, I remember it was early on. It was either the first year in Santa Barbara or the second year. We wanted to have um, live painting. And we called it lightning in a paint can. And uh, we had, and that, that started, that eventually started the nonprofit that we created, the Do Art Foundation. But lightning in a paint can was, you know, 15, 20 artists setting up with easels and just being scattered in cool areas around the festival. And they would just live paint at whenever they wanted, you know, could be four in the morning, could be 10 in the morning, whatever. Could be during one of their favorite sets. So we'd have them set up in stages, under trees, whatever. And you could see the influence of the music they were listening to in their painting. You could see the trees that they were under in their painting. It was like you would see, um, you know, the festival influences in, in what they created. I, I don't know why we decided early on we want live painting, but we just knew that it was interactive and, and inspirational and fun to... You know, we've been to art galleries. Art galleries can be stuffy. You know, you're just looking at a piece of art on a wall with a glass of wine, and, you know, they can be snooty or they can be fun, and they, they could be any, anything. But like you mentioned, seeing the process, seeing it happen in real time is, is different. Um, when one of the inspirations that the, the guys and I had, uh, this goes back to the, the Philadelphia Folk Festival in, God, mid-'90s early 90s uh god may have been the late 80s who knows but we were kids and we were running around our parents were off somewhere and and we just bailed and we were running around the festival and they had a vending row and uh in my mind it's very similar to the vending row that we have at lib now but there was uh, a candle making workshop just in a vending booth and we're watching people make candles and we joke about that today because for 18, 20 years we've been doing LIB, we've still been trying to find a candle maker because we got to make candles when we were kids and that was, we were creating something um, and we were watching the artist create something and that, that just stuck with us and we're like, it's all about happening in real time. So we have, we've always had in the early days those early events that we did, the warehouse parties and stuff, we would have a glass blower a uh, good artist friend, Adam Mostow, blew glass. So every time we did a show, Adam would be blowing glass, you know, and how cool is that? We had a, um, a blacksmith, Christian the blacksmith, and he would be doing his thing live, you know, and he'd, he loved kids, so he, kids would always work with him, and, and he'd teach kids how to do this. So it was just about participating and we wanted those live things, not just the live painters, but every aspect of the event. If you could do it live, we want to present that, and we want you to offer that. Hell yeah, man. Well, I know that you have a lot going on, so I want to be respectful of your time. Um, what are you most excited about in the upcoming weeks with LIB 2022? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, I, I'm super excited for the show to open up and, and start again because it'll, it'll have been three years since Holy shit. LIB was alive. And uh, for my brothers and I, that's the most important thing, you know, getting it. Because it was, uh, you know, it was on thin ice. You know, I'm not going to lie. The pandemic almost took us out. It was very, very close to taking us out. So to be this close to having it again is just like so exciting. Um, but to go to site next week with our team, it, it the, the most special part about it for a lot of us and for me is building it and spending that three weeks or so with our close friends, um, our peers, and getting to create and build this thing together as a family. Um, we all go to catering together. We all have our meetings together. We're out in the field working together, and it's just this huge collaborative process among the people that we respect the most. And that part is um, really, I think, why a lot of uh, festival people do what we do is that community that we have and that we create. So, you know, building it is is super special. But once the doors open and people come in, like, that's that's pretty unreal. God, man, what a feeling being closed for three years and getting right back into it, man. You are like, what a special moment in your life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
been a lot that's happened in these few years. Um, so to, to get it back and be this close to it is, uh, this year will be a little more special than, than the rest. So, yeah. yeah, man, I really appreciate what you do and, um, enjoyed talking to you, man. Yeah, you too. Yeah. It's been fun. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. See you at LIB.